All right, so welcome to Neighboring 101. This is our 54th session overall, and this is where we talk to people from all across the United States that are working in the neighboring movement, and we discover ways that organizations and individuals can use the art and skill of neighboring to improve their community and their own personal life. Um, just a few announcements before we get rolling today on this 54th session. A reminder that National Good Neighbor Day is September 28th. Make your plans now to participate. Check out that new website. I'll drop it in the chat feature as we go through the program today. And then also Missouri Good Neighbor Week, as always, is September 28th to October 4th. And if you're in Missouri, we'd love to have your participation in that. New this year is uh, selecting the most neighborly city in four different size categories based on uh, participation and nominations through the uh, Missouri Good Neighbor Week. Uh, I'll also mention now that next month, we're gonna have an online block party. Uh, we want you know as many attendees in person online as possible. We'll be going into break rooms and giving people a chance to network and meet other people that work in neighboring. It's a great way to come up with some new ideas and to share your success stories. And we will also be hearing from uh, Vanessa Ellis, who is founder of Block Party USA. You can find them online, blockpartyusa.org. And she'll be part of our online block party and celebration of Good Neighbor Day and Missouri Good Neighbor Week. That's next month's um, class. But our guest today is Brady Porter Porterfield Finn. And Brady is the Neighborhood Engagement Coordinator for the city of Arvada, Colorado. There, he is responsible for leading neighborhood programs, building relationships with as many of the 125,000 residents as he can. Now, side note, the city of Arvada uh, became somewhat famous in neighboring circles because it was the focus of the book, The Art of Neighboring, which was written by Dave Runyon and Jay Paddock. And this summer, I had actually an opportunity to visit Arvada and spend some time with Dave Runyon and with Brady. And I'll drop a link in the chat to a blog that I wrote about my Arvada experience and what I saw there and the, the amazing work that's taking place. But here's a few interesting facts about Brady that you might like to know before we hear his presentation and then pepper him with questions. He is a Mizzou graduate from the class of 2015. As far as we can tell, Brady and one other Mizzou graduate in Inglewood, Colorado, are the only two Mizzou people working in neighboring spaces, neighbor as a neighboring coordinator. So we just thought that was a really valuable and important connection. Uh, Brady studied journalism and psychology at Mizzou. His favorite memories of his time at Mizzou are volunteering on service trips with what's called Mizzou Alternative Breaks. That was one of his favorite activities. And you won't believe this, playing on the practice team for the, for the Mizzou women's basketball team. Uh, you don't get this perspective from Brady with his uh, monitor being low, but Brady's a good sized guy. And uh, I imagine he can play a good game of basketball and he kept the Mizzou women in tip top shape being on the practice team. Brady's career in community engagement has included serving in the Peace Corps and working for schools and nonprofits all around the world. And so we have four areas of work today that we'll discuss out of Arvada, including his uh, mediation program for neighbors and neighborhoods. Excited to learn about that and more that's happening in Arvada, Colorado. So Brady, welcome. We're glad to have you join us today. Thank you for having me, David. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I love keeping in touch with Mizzou, the state of Missouri overall. So excited to to see some of the guests that are on here today from different parts of the state. And only one correction to make about my bio. The women were keeping me in tip top shape. I was keeping up with them. They're <laughs> amazing athletes and it was so fun chasing them around and trying to keep up. <laughs> I, I, I wish there was some, there probably is some video available of that. I don't know, I'd like to see that sometime. <laughs> 
And, you know, shout out to Arvada. I've got a little Arvada hat. If you're out ever out in that area of Denver, Arvada is north of Denver and it's a lovely city and a great downtown, great eating places, great sidewalk cafes, and, but also a great neighboring program. I have a copy of their guide for connected neighbors there in Arvada that Brady gave to me and just um, a lot of work and activity that's taking place there. Um, how long has Arvada had this neighboring emphasis, neighboring department? Because I don't think you're the first in this position, right? Right, I'm the third official person to have the title of neighborhood engagement coordinator. The role has a long history and it's bounced from department to department. So it started as a collaboration between neighbors and the police department as a neighborhood watch group. And then it's evolved from there. It went up into the parks department and then over to the city manager's office, which is where I am now. So for about 10 years officially, it's been in this iteration of the role. But neighboring in Arvada dates back decades from what you talked about with Dave Runyon to neighbors long before that who were working hard to get to know each other and find ways to come together. And you, you mentioned a little bit of a history with the police department. I remember from our tour, something unique in Arvada is how the police department is located around the city. I mean, I, you might share about that. That's a great example of their the emphasis they still put on neighboring. Yeah, our Deputy City Manager Don Wick was the police chief for his current role, and he worked to get sector policing and that model um, integrated into the police department. So we have the map behind me here shows that our Vada stretch is really far wide from corner to corner. You can drive for 45 minutes. Um, it does go that far. And so they wanted officers to be policing and building relationships with consistency so that sector policing model led to four separate police stations that those officers are based out of and really get to know the neighbors that they're serving. It's uh, yeah, it's a great example. And it really uh, showed the importance of those neighborhoods and neighbor relationships. There's a lot of things like that. I mean, Arvada has invested a lot of money in this, not only in positions, but you do have a grant program that I think you, you help coordinate as well. And, some may have an interest in the grant program or how to have a healthy grant program. You want to share about that for a bit? Sure. The neighborhood grant program started about 14 years ago at the city. And right now we have three levels of grants that we fund to neighbors and neighborhoods that are registered with our Neighbors Connected program. So to get registered, you have to, to grab three other neighbors who are going to do the work with you because we know that for those um, sustainable relationships and initiatives to live on. It can't just all fall on one person. So three neighbors get together and they fill out the form, letting us know how many homes are active in their neighborhood, um, which part of the city they live in, what their goal is. Are they bringing people together? Are they concerned about safety? Do they want to have safe places for their kids to play? What's their goal of coming together? And then they can apply for neighborhood grants each year. So this year we had $19,000 in funding that we were able to disperse into levels of grants. So our first level is the Block Party Support Grant, and that's up to $200. Really meant to get people assistance buying food and drinks so that that investment, bringing people together, doesn't fall on one family or a couple families that the city can help offset that cost. So for food and non-alcoholic drinks, then the second level is our Neighborhood Experience Grant. And that's meant to, to increase what those gatherings look like. You can put together a, a bike workshop and invite someone in to help fix bikes or to teach kids how to ride bikes. You can have a local concert and have the money to pay for a band or to rent out a little venue in your neighborhood. So up to $500 is that second level. And then the third one, neighbors get really ambitious with what they wanna see happening in their spaces. So the neighborhood project grant is up to $3,000. So last year we had a neighborhood that works closely with a middle school put in a, um, a seed shed and a seed library so that they can have access at their community garden at the school for students and neighbors to be able to work together and to grow more in that garden. Um, little free libraries are a huge 
popular project that we have across Arvada. And so we've seen a big increase there and neighbors trying to, to build spaces where kids can come and trade books. Neighbors can come together and find a shared interest over what they're reading and what they recommend to others. Yeah, that's great. And obviously that's something the city council continues to support, right? Because they continue to budget funding for those grant dollars. And I, I would guess that for a lot of communities that want to start something like that, that's kind of the starting point. You got to get buy-in from your city council to fund something like that. Exactly. Having leadership backing, it, it takes the program so much further and it just reassures people that that funding will be there and that they can look forward to it the next year. The applications are competitive and sometimes we don't have the resources to fund all of them. So it does raise the competition and encourages them to make even more thorough applications. And the neighborhood grant guidebook that you held up is something we put together to try to give them the best chance of completing a successful application. So what to think through, what to do before you submit the application so that your neighborhood would be ready to go and you can make a great case for why you and your neighbors deserve that funding. Yeah, the book looks really step-by-step. -step. It's well put together and giving deadlines and successful examples from the past. And I know we saw some of those examples around the community and we drove the little free libraries and others. Um, I'll say this too about Brady. He, he didn't pay me to say this, but it was obvious in walking around city hall that he has a great reputation there in the city. You know, we were going by cubicles and people were, Hey Brady, Hey Brady, how are things Brady? I mean, so he's, he's fostering relationships in the community, but he has there at city hall as well. And that when you have that level of trust, other departments jump in and help want to see you be successful and help with what you're doing so that's an important part of it as well well i know you and i had talked about really talking about the five items or the four items that are on page five of your neighbors connected book i'll hold that up again well well done and just kind of going over these but again anyone if you have a question uh, as we're talking just you know raise your hand or jump in ask a question i'm sure Brady doesn't mind answering questions as we go along. So I'll, I'll open that right now. Any questions before we continue? Hey, Dave, this is Chad on the phone. Um, yeah. This neighbors, this neighbors Connected book, that sounds like a really interesting resource. Um, I don't know if that's, is that available online or is that a PDF or is that something you can send out to the class afterwards as a, you know, uh, some inspiration, motivation? It is available online. I can share that. Uh, with David to send out afterwards. I can also put the link to our neighborhood programs webpage in the chat. And then those who are here live can be able to access that. Um, and maybe when it's posted on YouTube later, we could put that in the bio of the yes. episode. But you'll be yes. able to see a PDF on the right hand side of that webpage when you open it up. There's a PDF. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks for asking that, Chad. Well, in that guide, uh, the four sort of connected programs that caught my eye, one of those is that block party trailer and outdoor movie uh, system. We've talked about block parties on here before, but kind of explain how you've managed that one in Arvada. Yeah, the block party trailer itself um, has been around about 10 years and it does look that way. It's a little bit worn. So we're looking at getting a new one, um, but it just shows how many neighbors have put it to good use. It's such a reliable way that neighbors um, look forward to. Each June from October is when that block party trailer is available and it's available for them to reserve for free. So they can rent it on a Thursday night, a Friday night or a Saturday. And it's got games, tables, chairs. Um, it's got a sound machine in there. So it has ways that make it easier to throw a big party and to have that infrastructure on wheels. And we pay a local company to transport that for us. So they have drivers that are taking it from neighborhood to neighborhood each weekend. And it fills up quick when we open that reservation system and neighbors are ready to go. They know each year they're bringing their neighbors together on Labor Day or they want to have um, a party on a specific day. They're ready to reserve it. I love that, that they're laying in wait. They already have their plans made. Just wait for the opportunity to, to reserve. And... Uh... 
Well, that, that's good to have one that has some signs of wear. It's that's being put to use. You'd hate for it to just uh, rust and collect cobwebs sitting on the road unused. Exactly. Yeah, it's a great symbol of of how active our community members have been in building those relationships with their neighbors. And the reason you can say that it has wear on it, I, if I recall from research about a year ago on some of this, that Arvada was really one of the early leaders in this uh, with block party approaches. I'm not sure where the idea came from for Arvada, but uh, you were one of those early leaders in that. So hats off to the city. And that is a great resource, really dovetails well with your neighborhood uh, leader network. Kind of explain to us a little bit about that network and what that what that is exactly. Yeah, the neighborhood leader network. We're working on adding that to our webpage, um, but it's a group that has really come together to trade resources with each other, to network, to get trainings, and um, build their contacts that they have in the city. So every quarter that group comes together. Um, in my year and a half leading this program, I've seen it have a room full of 50 people, which is awesome. Um, so that group, I think the, the best example and that we'll get into talking about is our neighbor conflict resolution training that we led that David mentioned the mediation program um, for neighbors just to be able to come to a space and say, what is your neighborhood look like? What are the dynamics you all are working through? We have generations mixing where we have older homeowners um, that have had their kids grow up and move on. And now some of those people moving out and younger families moving in. So what does communication look like? What do those relationships look like in each neighborhood? And how do we trade resources and learn from our experiences um, and set ourselves up for success in neighboring? So our next meeting is on August 27th. And the fire department is leading a presentation on emergency preparedness at the neighborhood level. So each quarter, I try to build a theme and market the program, get people interested, get new people to come show up, um, but for them to come learn from a local expert and take some of those strategies and those real actionable advice items from an expert like the fire department, take those back to your neighborhood and look out for each other. Yeah. I, I, that was going to be one of my questions is how you came up with the ideas for those meetings and trainings. Does some of it come from the neighborhood leaders themselves or, or are you kind of the driving force on that agenda? Yeah, I'm always listening to their ideas for what they want to see. Um, this year in February, we had our neighbor conflict resolution training, and that came about because of a neighbor that I was talking to on the phone. Um, his name's Frank, and he was having a hard time with his neighbor's when it was snowing, Frank was not able to get out and clear his sidewalk. So the relationship wasn't there for his neighbor to come check in with him and either to ask him to clear it off because it was becoming a safety issue with that ice freezing over and that part of the sidewalk becoming unusable. Um, but the relationship wasn't there. So the neighbor was reporting him to the police department and the code enforcement team came out and knocked on his door a few days in a row and he was very stressed out about it. So he gave me a call and I helped to find him a volunteer that would come remove snow off of his sidewalk and his driveway so that he could get where he needed to go. And that's so the, the neighbors could have a clear walkway to pass through. And I was able to do that because I have a Snow Buddies volunteer program that I manage. Um, it would have been much more challenging to find a volunteer so quickly without that that program already in place. So that's one of my other programs that I have here is our Snow Buddies volunteer program. Yeah, we want we definitely want to hear more about that. I know I've got a couple other questions about the leader network. I don't know if others do. Again, you, you're welcome to jump in anytime with questions. You, you mentioned, you know, typically have 40 or 50 people at those trainings, neighborhoods. What's what's in it for them? Why do people come to those neighborhood meetings and I asked because I continue to hear some cities and things talk about dwindling attendance and even the leaders aren't showing up and just kind of discouraged about that what what do you see how do you help your attendance why do you think they attend my first meeting that I took over 
um, 12 people came. And I was talking with our team just about what the group has looked like in the past coming out of the pandemic and trying to get people back out, get comfortable being in those social situations and what would get them there. So I talked with my team here at the city. I talked with neighbors about what would get them out because people are busy. They've got social commitments, sports teams they're on. They've got kids they're taking to different places, um, their jobs, and this is a volunteer commitment for them. So I took a lot of time to stop and listen and see what would get them out, what would be enticing. And that's what I've tried to continue to do. So looking at the day and time it's happening, seeing is that, mm. is that an option for everyone? Are there people who are working at that time or is that a time when families are having dinner? Um, is there a better day of the week, a time of the month that can lead to increased attendance? Those were all factors we looked at. And then the location, it is an in-person meeting. It does not have a, a virtual or a hybrid option. So I've been rotating the location around the city to make it more accessible for certain neighbors and neighborhoods. We do have such a large city um, that it can take 30 minutes for someone to get to a meeting. So I just rotate it around each section of the city and try to make that easier for people to access so that sometimes it might only be a six minute drive for you to come to the meeting and hang out. And then food, food's always a great one to get people out. So we provide dinner at those meetings. They start at 6 p.m. locally. And so the city provides a meal. So neighbors know I can come and if I can only make it for 30 minutes, great, but I'm gonna get free dinner. So I might as well go and get that meal, um, see some of my neighbors, meet some new people and come participate for as long as I can. And that's really what I've seen is that people bring their kids, they come after work and they've, they've really found comfort in getting to see each other each time and build those relationships. Yeah, that makes a world of difference. And a, another example of a big commitment from the city to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like you're a starting point with those types of leader networks is listening to the neighborhood leaders to see what, what they're needing some help with and their ideas about where and how to meet then. Exactly. And I was working in a school before this, I was leading the PTA group and it was a challenge there to get parents and families involved. So I think we see it across different types of engagement and types of community building that we know people care. It's just about how to find the format that works for them and how to, to build those relationships so that they know who's leading the program. They know that their voice matters and that they have a space to come be heard and come participate. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the Snow Buddies program is maybe one of the first things I heard that you were doing that I had to uh, chuckle, I guess is fair to say. Uh, I just, I think it's pretty unique, but I guess that there may be other examples in Colorado. I mean, it's just reflective of where I'm at. But uh, so A, it's interesting that way, kind of let us know what that's about, but it's at its heart, a volunteer program. Uh, recruiting and keeping volunteers involved. So I think there's lessons there for us to learn as well. Kind of give us an overview of the Snow Buddies volunteer program. Yeah, Laura shared here that they have a Snow Angels oh. program um, where she's at in Excelsior Springs. And there, across Colorado, there's a few other cities that have different names for their programs. Some are like Snow Angels. They're all doing the same thing as looking out for those who are either aging to a point where they can't take care of their sidewalks and their driveway um, or people with disabilities who need some support to be able to, to get out to the grocery store, go to doctor's appointments, get to work. Mm -hmm. And that's what this Snow Buddies volunteer program does. And it's been around uh, more than 20 years. So it's, it's a great program that I inherited and we've been able to grow. So each year we're seeing record highs in number of applications for people asking for a buddy. And then also our volunteer number is something I'm working really hard to get to continue to increase um, along with the applications. So we have a system where volunteers apply and I'm able to retain most of them each year. Some volunteers go and they shovel for one house. Others are able to manage two or three and build it along their route to school or to work. And this is a program um, that's in place for when it snows more than two inches. So under two inches, we have enough sunshine in Colorado for that to melt 
minute for it to, to go away naturally, but over two inches. And when we have some big storms, this program, is, it's really life-changing. And the, the volunteers feel that. Some of them are able to build relationships over the phone or they smile through the window with the person that they're shoveling for. And each year we have a kickoff party in October where the volunteers and the buddies come together and they can um, better get to know the people that they're working with and volunteers can meet each other. Some of them have started group texts and they'll say when they're heading on vacation and ask if someone can cover for them in case there's a, a snowstorm. And we give them pizza there at that party. And then to close the season um, in June, when we're celebrating the end of snow, we have an ice cream party. And that's another chance for the volunteers to be able to, to sit and chat with the people they've been shoveling for. And um, there were tears shed at the last one, people sharing just a couple of months ago, how special this program is for them. Wow, and that really helps build those connections between the buddies and people they're helping too. Mm -hmm. I've got a These are, go ahead. So I've got a question, a uh, follow-up question on the Snow Buddy program. How many of the of the volunteers are actually neighbors or like within live within say one or two blocks of the uh, households that are receiving the snow clearing service? I don't have an exact number on how many are within a few blocks, but that's part of our volunteer application is we're asking people, would you like to be matched with someone that's in walking distance from where you live? someone who's within one mile, within five miles. And so as I'm working through matching all of the volunteers um, in September to get ready for the first snow in October, that's something I'm looking at is how do we make these matches and these relationships sustainable so that someone can walk a few blocks down or a few houses down and that's who they're gonna shovel for and it's manageable and sustainable each year. So that is something that we take into prioritizing I love it. You know, key flyer that you could for someone who's receiving the services that they could even pass out to I don't know people on their block to, to see if there is a volunteer that would be willing to do it, so there isn't any transportation cost and they don't have to get in a car. And you know, you see, you mentioned some volunteers are doing routes. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it's so much more manageable. I love when it. It's on the same street. I love it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, vo volunteers love to feel appreciated. It sounds like you do that with these gathering events and some food involved. And I'm sure you have other communication too, but they like to know that they're making a difference and you're giving them that opportunity too, to see people face to face that their effort uh, uh, does impact real people. I think that's probably important to your retention. Or is there anything else you think that goes into the, strong retention numbers that you have? I think those parties help. Um, I give them free beanies, snow hats to wear that have our Snow Buddies logo on them. Um, those are fun. I'm about to submit a new order of those for the season and for new volunteers that haven't gotten them yet. But I think really what's at the core of it is just the, the fulfilling feeling you get, knowing that you're making a difference in someone's life. And it's powerful. So yeah. some of the some of those volunteers have great relationships with the people they're shoveling for. Others, the person inside is uh, more reserved. They're shy. They're grateful, but they're not at a point where they're wanting to be social or spend a lot of time getting to know their volunteer. So there's there's levels to all of those relationships, um, but I think that's what's at the core of it is really that feeling you get when you're volunteering for someone else. Well, and that could be at the core of any neighborhood volunteer activity doesn't have to be snow buddies right so relevant to another community what you're doing and in, in your town those same things apply i love that um if i lived in arvada i might sign up to do one or two i think That's maybe those big start. maybe those big multiple foot snowfalls don't sound as much fun as the the smaller ones but mm -hmm. yeah would love to be involved in that way. Well, one of the things that maybe people don't want to be involved in is neighborhood conflict. And um, I know Laura has already asked about this on chat. Uh, 
asking to hear a little more about the neighborhood mediation training. So neighborhood conflict resolution and kind of step us through kind of how that came about, maybe what it looks like presently and where it may be going in the future. Yeah, it came about with the story of the neighbor, Frank, who um, his neighbors were turning him in to the police department for not shallowing his sidewalk. So I talked with him. He's older. He has cancer. It's not something he could solve on his own. And then we really took a step back at the city to think through how we could prevent that from happening in the future. So can we encourage neighbors to look out for each other, to think through the context of what a conflict looks like, to build that relationship proactively so that when there is conflict, which is inevitable, there's always a level of conflict that we have in our relationships, that it lands better. It's easier to give someone critical feedback when you know who they are. But if your first interaction is knocking on their door and saying, hey, I don't like the way you're parking that car in front of my place or your snow is still sitting there and now it's turned into ice. It's so it's so hard to build that bridge when it's happening through conflict. So we wanted to look at proactive relationship building. And I talked with one of our commanders in the police department and then one of our um, organizational development trainers in the HR department. And I brought those two leaders together and met with them. We developed the training for the neighborhood leaders. And that's the group that we rolled this out to in February with the goal of encouraging those neighborhood leaders to look at the relationships they have, the dynamics they have in their neighborhood, and then think through how can I take these resources to my neighbors? How can I walk other people through this and really use them as amplifiers of this this philosophy. Now, as, as far as a philosophy, this is something that you kind of had in your wheelhouse, so to speak, in your background a little bit. Am I correct? The conflict resolution part? Yeah, there's some experience I had in, in managing conflicts, um, working in schools, working in different communities around the world. And trust and communication is what it always comes back to. So it was helpful for me to draw on some of those experiences and then looking through the data we have in our Ask Arvada um, feedback system that residents can submit thoughts, concerns, complaints to, I was able to see some trends in where people were having disagreements, where those, those conflicts kept coming up. So we had four categories we were able to focus this training on and snow and ice clearing, yard disputes, so how people were raking their leaves or not raking their leaves, Barking dogs, always a big one, and pet and livestock challenges, and then parking. Those were the four main trends we kept seeing and that we wanted to focus this training on. So what we did there was we developed some scenarios. So I wrote up some fictional scenarios of neighbors that were in conflict. And I based some of those on conversations I've had and some of the data that I was reading and change names, change addresses, and we passed those out to the neighbors. So some of them were talking about ice, barking dogs, and how would you approach the situation? Where would you start? And then on the back of that card, we had the exact city code or ordinance that was related to it. So when does a barking dog become a nuisance? How long do you have to clear the snow off of your property? Um, how should you handle a car that hasn't been moved in six days? or is, is blocking someone's driveway. All of those different situations we focused on with the neighborhood leaders. Yeah, I, I love that that was data-driven, that you looked at the data that was available and formed it around that. So fantastic example, and probably something that's relevant to a lot of other communities as well. And then, um, I, Laura, I want to be sure and give you an opportunity if you want to ask some follow-up questions there before I start getting into asking for some training tips from him. <laughs> Is that a curriculum available that your PD and HR leaders created? That's something that you and I could, could work on um, okay. offline or in another meeting. So we developed that um, specifically to our data, looking at the challenges we were seeing. I think that there is a lot of overlap yeah. into other communities. <laughs> Um, but it's not something that we have, we've rolled out yet to the community. 
That was a training we led in February, and there's been some interest in HOAs or different types of neighborhoods inviting us out to do a one-on-one -on -one session for their community members. That's something we're open to. Um, it just has not happened yet. Sounds like yeah, a, a great resource. Yeah, I would think there'd be real value in doing that training at HOAs or neighborhood meetings. I mean, it's something probably worth repeating over and over and over annually. And, yes. Uh, uh, in fact, I was I saw a headline this morning. I always get neighboring headlines through Google Alerts, and uh, seemed like this was in Michigan. The neighbor that was shot by his neighbor he was on a walk with his wife and kids and some sort of conflict over the the neighbor walking touched the guy's mulch in his yard and the guy went in and got a gun the dad stayed there to try and cool things off since him away and the the guy ended up shooting the neighbor killing him over a yard dispute which sound pretty benign so there may have been other issues going on right but i i'm reading i'm because i'm always hearing people say expressing some sort of fears about neighbors and getting to know them. And so it was a tragic situation. And then my second thought is, oh gosh, there's another dark, dark blot on neighboring and getting to know your neighbors. Right. But conflict resolution might not have helped in that situation, but so many, many others it does. So just even if those examples that you had shared, say we have a, a parking, a car that's been parked here for a couple of months uh, your city has an ordinance that addresses that. What what are kind of some of the steps? What is some of the approach that you're coaching people through on conflict resolution? Well, we try to encourage them to start softly. We try to approach this person um, at a time that works best for them. If you see that they're carrying groceries or they've got kids that they're bringing in or they're on their way out somewhere, it's probably not the best time they're not gonna be in the right headspace to, to be socializing or listening to feedback. So trying to find a time that works best, that feels appropriate, and then talking openly and honestly. So in person usually works best, texting, social media, phone calls, emails, those are convenient a lot of times, but knocking on the door and, and trying to open a dialogue there or start a relationship is the best first start. And then understanding, too, that people are all coming from different backgrounds, different stages in their life. There's so many different identity traits, um, race, cultural background, language, disabilities that can impact communication or how someone lives. And then thinking, too, about context, like how many years someone's lived in the neighborhood. Does someone who's lived there 10, 20, 30 years feel a level of ownership over public parking spots? or how something has always gone in the neighborhood. Is that a, a hierarchy there of control that a new neighbor might not be aware of or might not um, respect? There's so many different identity factors and context that comes into these, these neighbor conflicts. Yeah, that, that is great advice and great examples there. I One comes to my mind in the city of public where um, they, they didn't have what you're talking about as the starting point is, you know, having, having trust and having those face-to-face -face conversations. And th this neighbor was complaining about the other neighbors barking dog every night about the time they were trying to get their kids to sleep. The dog would just hang in the backyard and just bark constantly and nobody controlled it. And he was very upset about that. And so once we kind of uh, got past his anger over this because he let it brew for a long time to the point that he was now angry about it um, to get past that and get him and the neighbor face to face to meet each other and when he did that he he discovered something about his neighbor which was his, this older man had hearing aids and every evening this man was taking his hearing aids out at night and laying the dog go outside and that's when all the barking was happening. And so this neighbor actually didn't even know this was going on. So that changed the whole relationship uh, and the conversation immediately, 
right? I think the older man with the dog was certainly apologetic about it and worked to correct it. And it gave the other neighbor, helped him realize, gosh, I didn't even really know this about my neighbor. Um, now I completely understand what was going on. And it, they came to a really easy uh, solution on all of that. Oh, if they were all that easy, right? Right. And I have my hearing aids right here. I've worn these my whole life. So I can completely understand what it's like to take out my hearing aids and be making a bunch of noise. And um, my kids or my partner, people are telling me, hey, can you slow down over there? I don't think you realize how loud you're being. But they have the context and they have the relationship to be able to, to say that to me. So that's that's what can be improved when you know what your what your neighbor or what the people you're living around are living through what life is like for them so that's a great example of how just a little bit of context can to help to open that communication yes absolutely absolutely well i i love that that training is available and that i just think there's such value in that i know some other cities that have talked about and have decided to stay out of that type of space afraid a little bit of what they would get into perhaps um I think it's neat that you guys have embraced that and that you're taking it step by step to see where it can lead. Um, you have any goals for that long term beyond maybe just trainings in, na in na neighborhoods? We haven't gotten that far yet. Um, what we ended that training with was a message centered around um, using resources responsibly. So for neighbors to have one, the resources to resolve some of those conflicts locally and to feel empowered to do so. And then also to consider what calls to emergency services look like when they are not for true emergencies. So are you taking resources away from the police department, from the fire department, when they have to come um, check on you or your neighbors for something that's not truly an emergency? So that's what we, we ended that conversation with was know that those services are there for you, that that's what that taxpayer funding goes into, and also um, slow down to think about the level of urgency something might have um, if you think it's solvable locally. So I think it'll be fun to look through the data next year in five years and see have any of those specific calls um, for noise disturbances or public parking issues to see what those trends look like and has there been any difference or will we need more time to see if those relationships have been built and lead to future changes? Yeah, that that is really exciting to think about what that could look like down the road and great advice that you've given here. Um, others, the floor is yours. Jump in with some questions for Brady. There's a few on this call I know that always have questions, so. Chet's already asked a question or two, Morgan or Patty. Hey, there's Patty. Hi, I've got a question for you. Hi, how Patty. Did you come, hi. How did you come up with the money to get your prizes started? How did we come up with the funding to get which part of our program started? Like your prizes, the 600 or 100, oh, 500,000, all those, did those come from the city or were they from a fund? Yeah, the neighborhood grant program. Those, the funding for that came through our community engagement budget that we have here at the city. So there was funding allocated um, by our city manager and then approved by city council to be able to, to focus on this investment in building relationships, giving resources to neighbors and giving them a chance to access these funds and to work on some of these projects in their neighborhoods. Cool. So it was, so it was not part of like a community block grant or something like that initially, if state funded monies or anything. I remember meeting with Dave Runyon, who you referenced earlier, and I think he told me that some of the churches came together. There was an Arvada Faith Network that might have contributed donations or raised all of the funding 
to buy the block party trailer. So to start some of those initial programs, I think there was a lot of community involvement. And then now going forward, we've gotten to a level where leadership is bought in and where the community expects every June to see that block party trailer open up and to see some of these resources there for them. So we do have consistent funding that's been set aside. That's cool. Patty, in, in Springfield, it just starts with your neighborhood council and trying to, you know, working with uh, your city council representative, perhaps, to add some more um, funds available to something like that. We shall Ooh. see. We shall see. Good luck. Good luck. Uh, I, 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 think, have a, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, get a little echo here. Um, the question I have has to do with identifying and getting people to volunteer to be the neighborhood leader. You talked about the neighbor leader network. Any suggestions uh, or maybe some of your experience? Is it easy? Is it difficult? Uh, where do you find these local uh, neighborhood leaders? Uh, and uh, tell, tell us how to do that. <laughs> I wish I had a an exact answer, but I think being creative is what can lead to the most success. So for me, I draw on a lot of my time working in education and looking at the map, seeing where these neighborhoods are, what kind of schools are close by, and then trying to find elementary schools where younger parents are more likely to be active and engaged with those kids. Mm -hmm. The earlier grade levels, I've found that those parents are locked in because their kid is just starting their education. In middle school and high school, the parents seem to step back um, and their kids are taking more of, more of the active role there. So looking at PTA groups, looking at family groups at the school, trying to, to go through local rec centers and see what kind of community spaces are there. Coffee shops where you could put up flyers, where you could advertise your block party. So looking at what's already in place in your neighborhood, in your community, and where can you start to search for someone who might be that person bringing people together, serving as that leader, and wanting to collaborate further. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got a question. Yeah. You mentioned um, you mentioned you're you're really curious to look at the data next year to see, you know, what the reduction in you know um, you know parking complaints and um, uh, nine one one unnecessary nine one one calls. I think I think that inevitably should transfer or translate to a cost savings for the local municipalities um, when you're empowering and encouraging neighbors to work through their work through their own problems together without needing a, uh, an, an, a third party official enforcement person. I'm wondering, have you or can you uh, estimate a cost savings to the city, county, state government? And, uh, and is that maybe a possible uh, funding, future current or future funding source? It's a sense? great, yeah, it's a great question. And it is something we thought through here is when a car goes out with one person or two person, two people in it, a fire truck shows up, what does all that cost? I don't have the exact numbers on what each trip costs. I think it depends on who's called, um, how many different responding agencies are going at the same time to a call. But that's exactly where we were thinking was where can our resources go further and who else can we support? And have the space to get to um, if neighbors are working through some of the manageable conflicts successfully. And not all of them are manageable. The one David mentioned in Michigan, where it, it escalated into violence and into to someone's life being lost, that's not something that neighborhood conflict resolution is going to be able to solve. So that runs much deeper. And when safety is threatened, we want neighbors to feel like all their 911 calls are necessary um, if it gets to that point. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Any other questions from class members? I want to be sure and give you that opportunity. It's one of the advantages, uh, one of the benefits of being here online live is the opportunity to ask these questions. So, Well, if, if there are no others, we're going to end this with a little bit of a smile and a chuckle today. Uh, I had just a, about a two minute video to share with you. This actually comes from Arvada, Colorado. And uh, it's kind of in keeping with uh, the season. And uh, I think it'll be self-explanatory as to how it's in keeping with the season. And hopefully you can enjoy a smile from this. Political debates between neighbors can get testy. Just ask Justice Alito's wife. But two neighbors in Arvada are having some fun with this season of competing yard signs. We know that this election year is kind of anxious for all of us. So we came up with the idea of just making our neighbors walk by and smile. And that's Molly over there. We're just going to say hi. Plus, it has a dog on it. So, you know, you can't beat that. We had the opportunity to lighten things up. And so we went for it. Good girl, Molly. And this is Molly Kaufman. She's running for president. And uh, we happen to have a, a dog next door that is also running for president. This is our beloved dog, Chloe. She like trances out on the ball. She looks insane right now. She's always been the one that corrals all the other dogs at the dog park. So I knew she had kind of a, a head for politics and leadership. They've lived next door to each other for years and they respect each other's views. Her stance is um, anti-squirrel. She just wants more treats for everyone in the community. She's older. She's wiser. Um, Chloe. Chloe. She's wandering off. Even though the election year can be a little anxious for us, it's good to remember that, you know, you just have to keep everything in perspective and still be kind to your neighbor. And that's what's really most important okay get your ball and there you have it hope you enjoyed that i, I love the the contrast of the two you know molly has great leadership chloe was wandering off you know just it was cute loved how they did that well gr great things are happening in arvada not just with uh, yard signs and competing dogs uh for presidents but right there at city hall in the neighborhood engagement program and with the coordinator Brady so glad you're able to join us today and uh uh oh neighborhood walks yes I'm sorry before, did I miss up yes please add that before we sign off I wanted to share um, an example of how a neighbor was able to launch a program with us that just came from an idea they had we have a neighborhood walks program that was inspired by some neighbors out in North Carolina who were leading a series of walks for people to get to know each other and focus on different topics. And one of the neighborhood leaders I work with, his name is Jordan, and he came to me with an idea of setting up a series of walks, inviting people to get to know each other and having that, that ability to create a new program has really introduced us to neighbors that we're not familiar with, to neighborhoods that we haven't walked in before. And we've had two walks so far, one in June and July. The third walk is scheduled for the 21st of August next week. And then our fourth walk in September will be a birding walk. So we've got a local nature center where the birding expert has agreed to provide binoculars and lead a walk for us. So hoping to bring out a different crowd and a different group of neighbors to join us on that fourth walk. So this is, it's an awesome new program that was created by neighbors and for neighbors. And being able to step back from that program and really empower Jordan to lead it has been super fun for me. Yeah, that's super when you have a neighbor step up and volunteer to lead something like that, grassroots involvement, grassroots led. So, uh, but you've kind of laid the, you and others at the city have helped lay the table to help make something like that happen to help foster neighbors that would 
commit to leading something like that and have said we're supportive and we're interested and share your ideas. It's the two go hand in hand. One doesn't happen without the other. So really appreciate the work that you're doing in Arvada and how you're representing Mizzou in the neighboring space and neighboring world. Brady, thanks for being on with us today. Thanks for having me. It was great to, to meet some of your class members here, and I'd love to stay connected with anyone who'd like to. All right. Open invitation. I'll include a little bit of that in the uh, the description of the video when it posts. And But until next week, I'll hit the uh, stop button on the record at least. Next week or next month? Uh, next month. <laughs>